When an object has energy by virtue of its motion, we say that the object has kinetic energy. It is also possible for an object to have potential energy, or energy associated with forces that depend on the position or configuration of an object. Anytime an object moves in a vertical direction, we have to take into account the force of gravity acting on it. When we climb stairs, lift a box, climb a tree, we are now moving in a vertical direction. We are applying the force upwards, but there is also the force of gravity pulling it down. This implies that there is work being done by the two different forces. Now work done is the force applied over a certain distance. As you remember, the force of gravity is a product of the mass of the object and the acceleration of the Earth, so we want to use those specific variables. We also change the d in our work equation to h, just to designate that the motion is vertical. When you do work against the gravitational force, that energy becomes stored as gravitational potential energy. An object's gravitational potential energy is due to its position relative to the Earth. When positive work is done on the object, it means that the distance above the Earth is increasing, and so the gravitational potential energy increases as well. If the object gets closer to the Earth, then we say that the negative work is being done, and the gravitational potential energy decreases. This makes sense if you really think about falling out of a window. If you fall out of a first story window, you will convert your gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, and you will hit the ground with a certain force. If you fall out of the third story window, you have more gravitational potential energy because your distance above the ground is larger. So when that potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, you will hit the ground with much more force. So if a negative work is done on the object, this means that the distance above the Earth is decreasing, and so the gravitational potential energy also decreases. So we have defined the change in potential energy as the mass of the object times its change in height times the gravitational acceleration. This applies for any path where there is a change in height, whether it is straight up vertical or at some angle. If you lift the television with a pulley up the third floor, you have a change of height in h. If you carry it up three flights of stairs, you have the same change in height, and therefore the same change in potential energy. So it doesn't matter how you get there. If the change in height is the same, then the change in potential energy is the same. A 60 kilogram person jumps onto the floor from a height of 3 meters. If he lands stiffly, which means his knee joints are compressing by about half a centimeter, calculate the force on the knee joints. The person in question starts out with a certain amount of gravitational potential energy, which is transformed into kinetic energy as he falls. Upon hitting the floor, his kinetic energy becomes zero. We are looking for the force on his knees as he hits the floor. His knees move a total of 0.5 centimeters, and we know that the work done is equal to the force times the distance his knees move. Since the change in distance of his knees and the force applied by the floor are in opposite directions, we label this with a negative sign. We also know that the work done is equal to the kinetic energy he had before he landed, and that the kinetic energy came from the potential energy stored in his position above the ground. Now there's a tiny bit of change in gravitational potential energy because of the change in height of the knee. However, if we compare that to the height and change of this body itself, it is very small and we can ignore it. So getting through all of that, we end up with our force and distance equal to the gravitational potential energy. So plugging in and rearranging, we get 3.53 times 10 to the fifth newtons of force on his knee. If that seems like a lot, you're right. If you've ever landed stiff-legged after a jump, you know that a very large force is being applied to your knees. You probably know that if you were to bend your knees upon impact, it will absorb some of that shock and won't hurt quite as badly. So what if that same person jumps from the same floor, but he lands with his knees bending a distance of 0.5 meters? Cal <clears throat> calculate the force on the knee joints at that situation. What we're looking at is how is the force on the knees changing if the person bends his knees for a distance of a half a meter to absorb the impact. The only difference in this problem is the distance over which the force acts. So instead of a half a centimeter of distance, it is a half a meter, 
This reduces the force by a magnitude of 100, which is significantly less than our first situation. So say we have a roller coaster that starts at the top of a hill and ends on a flat surface 20 meters below the top of that hill. What is the final speed of the roller coaster if it starts from rest at the top and work done by frictional forces are negligible? The coaster has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy because of its position at the top of the hill. As it moves down the slope, that energy, that potential energy, is changed into kinetic energy. Since the coaster does not go all the way to the ground, we look at the change in height from the top of the hill to the top of the second hill as 20 meters. This potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, and if friction is negligible, then the only force acting on the coaster is the force of gravity. Since we are looking for the final speed of the coaster, we want to use the formula for kinetic energy. Interestingly, mass is found on both sides of this equation, so we do not need to consider it in our calculations. This is consistent with our observations of falling objects when friction is absent. So if we solve to get velocity by itself and substitute in our numbers, we find a final velocity of 19.8 meters per second. Now how does the final velocity change if the coaster starts with a velocity of 5 meters per second? We still have a gravitational potential energy equal to our change in kinetic energy. In this case, however, we have to take into account that there is an initial kinetic energy. Let's go ahead and get rid of our masses and solve for our final velocity. While this velocity is higher than the while this velocity is higher than the final velocity with no kinetic energy, it is really not by very much. We can also consider the potential energy associated with elastic materials. Take the spring in figure 7.10. If you stretch or compress the spring, it has potential energy because when it is released, it has the ability to do work. If we stretch the spring a certain distance, x, from its resting position, the external force required to stretch the spring is proportional to the distance the spring is stretched. This proportion can be described by k, which is called the spring constant, and is a measure of the stiffness of the particular spring you are using. The spring itself exerts a force when it is compressed or stretched in the opposite direction of the external force. This is often referred to as a restoring force because the spring exerts a force in the opposite direction in order to return to its resting state. This equation is referred to as the spring equation or Hooke's law. This equation will hold true as long as the spring is not stretched to the point where it is structurally damaged and cannot return to its original state. We can calculate the potential energy of a stretched spring by calculating the work done to stretch it. We can start with our original work equation, where work is equal to the force times the distance. The problem is that the force is not evenly applied as the spring is stretched. We just learned that the force varies with the length of the string, so we need to take that into account in our calculations. If we were to graph that change in force, we would get that proportional relationship and be able to see that the total force is equal to the average force applied over time for whatever amount x the spring is stretched. We can then take our work equation and substitute in the expression for the average force and find that the work done is equal to one half of the spring constant times the distance squared. In turn, the elastic potential energy for the spring is also one half the constant times the distance squared. Note that for a spring, the reference point for zero is the resting state of the spring, and the spring can either be compressed in one direction <clears throat> or stretched in the other. For each situation, x represents the distance from this resting state in either direction, and as such, this equation can be used either for the compression or stretching of a spring. So the key thing about potential energy is that it is stored energy. Because of the object's position, it has the ability to do work, even though it is not yet doing so. The change in the potential energy associated with any force is equal to the negative work done by that force when the object is moved from one position to another.